Well, good evening, everybody, and on behalf of the Stations Company, welcome to this, our second of our industry-related events in 2021. Um, we work very hard to um, reflect our content and communication industries. So uh, we're very much looking forward to our theme tonight. The next event that we have is on packaging, sustainability and environment in February. So I hope those of you who are not members who are interested enough to join us tonight will have a look at our website. And if you enjoy this evening, you're most welcome to join us um, on another occasion. Um, we always welcome members if you have a connection with one of our trades, professions or industries. So again, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about the company, um, do look at our, at our website. Um, a couple of logistic things uh, this evening. You'll see in the top left hand of your screen that we are recording um, our speakers this evening. That's because not everybody um, can always join us on the evening and we also like to put it up on our YouTube channel for others to, to reflect and to catch up a little later. Um, questions during the event at any stage, uh, just use the Q&A button to flag a question and those will be being monitored during the evening and we'll try and get through to answering as many of them or as many of the, the, the grouped themes um, as we can. So from me, um, as chair of the industry committee, I'm really delighted to hand over to Freeman Benedict Richards, who has coordinated this evening's event and will be your chair for this evening. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so on behalf of the station's company, I'd like to welcome you all as well, particularly our three expert speakers who have all well-researched and informative presentations to show us. Um, I know there's a lot of people uh, in this talk, I uh, saw the list of attendees and as well as some ex-colleagues, stationers, ex-students, lots of others too. I think we were probably about 100 and, or late hundreds, if not early 200s in here. So welcome everyone. So the order of the evening is as follows. Uh, firstly, I will do a short introduction and then we will have our three speakers, um, each of whom are gonna speak for about 15 minutes each. Um, Louisa, Bates will go first, Freeman, Richard Chapman second, and then David Livingston. I'll jump in between speakers to hand over, and at the end, there will be an opportunity to ask questions via the Q&A, which uh, Livingston and Carol has already mentioned. Um, we'll, you can type in and we'll go through them at the end. So as there's quite a few people here who might not have a connection with the station's company, um, before we dive in with the main event, um, I'd just like to explain briefly um, who and what the station are. So the station's company uh, helps individuals and organisations in the communications and content industries improve their performance and prospects. Our unique 600 year old tradition, 600 years, combines conviviality with the enhancement of business and society from the invention of copyright to the contributions we make today through education training and charitable endeavour. The Stations Company has its roots from about 1400 in the City of London as a trade guild, um, almost like a union, to protect the interests of manuscript writers and illuminators. So this is before printing. Unlike most craftsmen in those days who were itinerant, uh, they set up stalls or stations around St Paul's Cathedral and um, from that, they acquired the nickname Stationers. Over the centuries, the Stationers had the good sense to embrace printing and every new technological advance in the communications and content industry, right up uh, to today's digital media and online publishing. The company is unique among the older London liveries in its high relevance to its modern industries. Out of nearly a thousand members today, the vast majority are actively involved in paper, print, publishing, packaging, office products, newspapers, broadcasting, online media, and even graphic design. In this fast and ever-changing world, the stations company continues to be the link from the past to the future. Uh, if you'd like to find out more or interested in joining, um, please visit stationers.org. Um, and so on to our subject for this evening, typography and branding, creating ideas and image. 
Um, so much has been said about typography that I'm not going to make any attempt to give you some original insights. I'm going to leave that to the speakers. What I, what I will say, especially for the uninitiated or the person at the start of a career, is that typography can become a perennial source of fascination. So you need to watch out. A career in design is sometimes referred to as a lifelong apprenticeship. Just when you think you understand it, a new brief arrives and the whole new set of problems arrives that need solving. It still amazes me that with the right words, in the right typeface and the right colours, you can change someone's behaviour. Designer can help create a particular perception of a product or service, persuade people to buy something or inform and educate somebody, sometimes without them even realising. Graphic design and typography have some influence, us, influence on us, whether we like it or not. The activity touches many of us because even if you're not a professional designer, you might be dipping your toe in the water by making presentations, bits of publicity, or making your own websites. Choosing fonts for these things can be totally subjective. Someone once said that there are two sorts of typefaces, the ones with the bits on and the ones with the bits off, but a recent estimate is that there is a half a million digital fonts in existence. Choice is abundant, but perhaps at the expense of visual judgment and professional expertise. Our expert speakers will take us through type creation, choice and use. They're all experienced and knowledgeable designers who have worked in a variety of fields, but all with a typographic focus. I'm gonna mention David first, our third speaker. He's worked within publishing, brand identity, and latterly wayfinding. He'll be speaking about that tonight. Our second speaker is Freeman Richard Chapman, who has broad experience of branding and web design within a variety of sectors. He'll be talking to us about type on the web. But our first speaker is Louisa Beta, who has designed typefaces as well as worked within type in branding for over 10 years. After studying at the LCC and completing her MA in typeface design at Reading University, she worked for the well-known type studio Dalton Marg in London, but has more recently been working independently on a variety of projects. She's joining us from Brooklyn, where she's been based for the last five years. So over to you, Louisa. Um, you'll have to unmute and um, share yes. your screen. Thank you. Let me start sharing. Uh, here we go. Um, thank you so much. I'd like to start by thanking Benedict and the Stationers Company for inviting me for this event and, of course, to everyone who is watching tonight. Um, I, my name is Louisa and, as Benedict said, I've been working with typography and branding in a variety of ways uh, for a few years. And today I'm going to be showing you two case studies so that we can discuss how custom type might work on a small scale and a large scale. So um, I'll start off by saying that custom typography can bring you many advantages in branding and in branding identity. And I'd like to start by taking a quick look at why a brand might be interested in doing custom type. Um, so uh, one of the reasons uh, is uniqueness. So if typography is the voice with which your brand is speaking, so there are the things that your brand says in the messaging and the language, but the voice that it uses is represented visually by typography. And if this can be made unique, the brand is stronger for it. So uh, here's an example of the new typeface for the new rebranding for Burger King uh, done by John Snow's Richie and the Colophon Type Foundry. Uh, the typeface um, is very... Uh, It shows very clearly the identity of the brand and it's nostalgic and it's juicy and it represents this voice uh, quite loudly and boldly and it's unique to them. So it's still a new brand, but I think this will be quite recognizable um, as we go forward. Um, another reason is the tailoring. So a custom typeface is made specifically to solve the company's specific brief. So it's the specific problems that the company has, uh, its technology and its branding strategy. Uh, 
So for example, for Lush Cosmetics on Dalton Mag, uh, it was a custom made typeface um, made to, based on the handwriting of the letters that worked at Lush Cosmetics and they used to hand letter the packaging. So this was made so that the typeface could be used on the web and it was specific to them. Um, it's nobody else's, it was uh, specifically for their brief. Um, another advantage is recognition and brand recognition is very important. It's, uh, and to do that through typography is so crucial nowadays where so much of what we encounter is digital because a few years ago, um, if you are reading a newspaper or a publication, for example, you would have the size of the paper and the color of the paper, the texture. Uh, there are a lot of elements that make that paper recognizable. And now uh, a lot of people tend to just read the news online on their phones or on their screens. And that's an equalizer for all the newspapers and publications out there. The same goes for retail and food and so much of what we encounter is online. So uh, because a lot of other variables of brand recognition are removed from the equation when everybody's just looking at the same kind of screens, uh, typography is very, very important uh, as a way to, to make the brand recognizable. Um, I used as an example the Guardian collection by Commercial Type, and if you're a Guardian reader and you encounter this typeface uh, used by someone else because it is for, for sale through the Commercial Type website, you're likely to immediately have that pang of recognition of the Guardian. Um, it's a uh, if it's something you read every day, it, it, it becomes part of what the Guardian looks like. Um, so, um, oh, it's not going, it seems my presentation is not going forward and now it skipped several. <laughs> okay, it's okay. We're one year into the pandemic, we're used to uh, this kind of mishaps. Uh, so the point that I want to make is that the scale and scope of a custom type project can vary immensely. Uh, it can be just a custom logo type, something that the letter forms it are designed specifically for a logo. Uh, it can be modifications of an existing typeface from a type founder's library, or it can be a single way to display family that will be used in conjunction with the typeface that is licensed from somewhere. It can be a multi-weight super family or even a global multi-weight and multi-script super family. There's a lot in between. Uh, so uh, I would like to, to show two examples of these that are on two different ends of the spectrum. Um, so the first uh, project that I'd like to show you is the Nokia Pure project that was designed by Dalton Mag around 2012. I say around because it's a long project and it lasts many years. In 2012, I believe is when the first batch was released, but they had already been working on it for a while and continued working for a while too. So this was a very large project. Nokia is a global brand uh, with that was selling phones and devices all over the world. And this was a multi-script type family. It came in two variants. Uh, UI, that's user interface. In this case, that relates to the text typeface that would be read on primarily on small screens. And headline, uh, that is the display typeface used primarily on advertising and packaging and all of that. Um, so my presentation has a little lag, I apologize, but here we are. Um, so the previous typeface that Nokia was using for their brand was Nokia Sans that was designed by Eric Speakerman, I believe around 2001 or 2002. Um, and some of the reasons why uh, the brand took on this ambitious project, uh, one of the main reasons are changes in technology. So the screens in the beginning of the 2000s uh, had a much lower resolution than they had later. So the typefaces that were designed for the screens had to be designed uh, with very specific legibility requirements in mind. 
Uh, and as the technology evolved and the resolution became better, it was possible to uh, to do other shapes and to to do very legible type faces that, that looked different. And in this case, uh, since we're talking to an institution with such a long history, um, I might make a parallel to changes in technology throughout history that have changed typefaces as well. Um, when it was possible to print in finer paper and to, to make finer, more refined details on typefaces, you would have the possibility of having typefaces that look like Baskerville or Didot or Bodoni. And technology changes the shape of typefaces and it also changes the tastes that are associated with the typefaces, the typefaces that are in fashion and invoked in those days. Uh, so the previous typeface uh, was very good for its purpose, but it was becoming associated with a certain type, uh, with a certain moment in time. It was perhaps getting a little bit dated uh, by 2012. There were other uh, big strategy and businesses, this business decisions going on behind the, the closed doors, I suppose, because Nokia sales were declining with the rise of the iPhone. And uh, Nokia was actually acquired by Microsoft shortly after this project came out. So I'm sure there were other uh, concerns that we were not um, privy to at the time. Um, there's also a global need of delivering consistent branding and a similar user interface uh, for their users throughout the world that use different writing systems and they should all recognize that they are using Nokia. And finally, there's also a financial decision. In a company in this scale, it sometimes makes financial sense for them to, to get a custom typeface that's proprietary to them instead of licensing uh, a typeface for all of their devices all throughout the company, all over the world. Um, a license needs to be renewed and maybe it just makes financial sense to invest this money and then own the typeface and the rights to it. Uh, so here's a comparison between Nokia Sans and Nokia Pure. And this is a closer look at Nokia Pure. This is the headline version. So uh, the branding strategy was looking for the traditions of finished design, things like simplicity and clarity, functionality and beauty of form. So it is quite a pared down typeface, uh, but it was designed to appeal to this kind of aesthetic and these keywords. Um, I'd like to also show you an example. I worked on this project for uh, Nokia Pure Ethiopic. Um, it's just one of the many scripts. I think there were 19 scripts in total that the Nokia project did. Um, and Ethiopic or the Amharic script, it's quite a rare treat to be able to work on this um, as unfortunately it's not that often that companies from Ethiopia have the money to uh, commission a uh, custom type. So, um, it was very special. I'm proud of having worked on this. So uh, it's an example of how when you work on different scripts, you're not looking to replicate shapes between one script and the other. You're looking for a similar approach and um, harmonious color and texture of the paragraph. So this is what I wanted to show. Um, and this is what the display typeface looks like in packaging. Um, kind of what the brand looked like as a whole at the time. Uh, so the, this is the example that I wanted to show you of something that's on a very large and global scale. And the next example I will show, the next case study, is for something at the other end of the spectrum. It's a small type project for a very local brand. Uh, so this is a project for Frenchette. Uh, I worked on this here in New York. It's a custom lettered logo for a small restaurant in the south of Manhattan. So unlike Nokia, this is unlikely to be seen all over the world. It will be seen by the people who go to the restaurant, who live in the neighborhood and who live in the city. Um, it is, of course, a very competitive restaurant scene in New York. So uh, 
restaurants do take, tend to take the branding quite seriously, um, but it was a very fun project to work on. So this is the custom logo that I drew. Um, this was done while I was at MUCA Design here in New York. So this restaurant is a sort of New York French bistro. It had a lot of contradictory terms in the branding uh, approach and strategy. So it had to be uh, high scale, but casual and uh, approachable, but luxurious French and New York, you know, just a lot of these very um, contradictory terms. Uh, but this also made it very fun to do a script that is relaxed but also very controlled and that looks French but also kind of contemporary New York, this this kind of thing. Uh, and the logo had a very um, central spot in the branding. Uh, so here are some examples of uh, how it was used uh, in um, on the gilding, on the on the glass and on pins and all over and also the angle of the logo is used um, on the menu. So this, uh, Mocha Design is a small branding studio and both myself and the creative director had experience in type design. So we started playing around with this a little more. Um, we didn't, we were not commissioned to design a full type face and we didn't design a full type face, but at some point when designing the elements in the branding, we felt the need to bring the script from the logo into other parts as well. Uh, so there's here an example of where it says Marche on the on the menu, or uh, Toilette on the wayfinding <laughs> signs uh, in the um, in the restaurant. So this is an example of having a custom typography on a very small scale. It is an incomplete display script that is used sporadically throughout the branding, but it does bring some of the advantages that we discussed at the beginning, um, such as being unique and tailored to the, to the brief. And as I said, it's just a, a complete uh, different end of the spectrum. Um, so, this is it for me. I wanted to just show these two projects so that uh, we could discuss um, the different scales. And thank you so much. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really, really interesting. And um, uh, we'll, what we'll do is we'll do questions at the end. Um, but that was really interesting. It's great to see how you can play out such a a large project and then it's the same knowledge and understanding and judgment applied to a small project it's really interesting so thank you very much okay so um our second speaker is freeman richard chapman who has uh, run his own multi-award winning design studio in west london for nearly 20 years they specialize in branding and web design for clients of all sizes across a variety of sectors in the UK and internationally. After studying at the LCP, now the LCC, and then Goldsmiths, he worked at Condé Nast and Conran before setting up on his own. So I'm gonna hand over to Richard now, who will then share his screen and um, show us his lovely work and thoughts. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thanks to the stationers, and in particular, Ben, for inviting me to be a part of this evening. I realized recently that my career has been defined by an evolution of graphic design on the internet. This is less to do with my work over the past 20 years, and more to do with the fact that the web has been a constant background presence. Everything about how it looks and acts has changed so much, sometimes slowly, sometimes rather more quickly. So rather than being a potted history of type on the web, the story I wanted to tell today is a more personal one, technological change in parallel with my working life. I'm imagining a love for beautiful type is something we all share, but the fact is that the internet is broadly a functional thing rather than a home of expressive design. 
but every page you see has some element of design at its core. The same could be said of a newspaper and look how that medium has fundamentally shifted in the desktop publishing era. One of the things we must have all noticed is how significantly the use of type online has changed, particularly on sites like gov.uk that are information led. And a few of you must have wondered why and how this change ahead occurred. But I'm getting ahead of myself. When I began to learn about design and typography, it was at, like uh, Louisa at the London College of Printing and then latterly Goldsmiths. In the mid 1990s, my until then personal interest in design had become more formal, educated into an understanding and appreciation of beautiful type. And upon reflection, now I look back at that period, it, I think I was lucky to be at the right place at the right time. So students are necessarily tigerish firebrands. And while my contemporaries and I learned about the classic rules of typography at college, it was blended with a fascination with the new wave of type designers of that era. Uh, we were reading magazines such as The Face or Reagan, and uh, we revered radical mavericks such as Neville Brody and David Carson, who founded Reagan, as much as Eric Gill. And so my fascination with new typography continued as I began work and that led to my buying typefaces from all kinds of places for the work we were doing. Um, particularly Emma Gray, uh, a foundry in California, was at the time creating incredibly influential work and uh, my college friends and I were completely obsessed with it. Now we're very used to instant gratification these days but at that time I place an order and then a week or two later, a floppy disk, remember those, or CD-ROM with the typeface files would arrive all the way from California. And at which point we could then use it in the logo or whatever print project we'd decided we simply had to have it for. It was cumbersome, but at least it was current. However, web fonts were a very different story. And I think to truly appreciate why type on the web is exciting today, it's necessary to take a step back and understand why design at that point was incredibly frustrating and let's be honest, limited. Um, when my business started designing websites for browsers like Internet Explorer or Netscape Navigator, and we're talking about, we started the business in 2003 and so we began doing websites in 2004 or 5 and um, rather than potential every stage involved restriction. Pages had to be 850 pixels wide and could only apply from a selection of 10 typefaces. These are they and um, the reason for this um, was because those typefaces had to be installed on your computer wherever you happen to be whether in London or, uh, or or anywhere, you know, you uh, had to have this typeface installed. Those were the only ones set you could guarantee globally. Of these, one of those was the monospaced courier, bottom left here. And uh, for me, I, you know, I grew up using electric typewriters, but I think I'd grown out of those by that stage and uh, was well shot of that. And another was Comic Sans. Well, less said about that, the better probably. What it meant was that designing for the web in those early years was always in spite of something, an intensely limited state of affairs. Websites were very much a poor cousin creatively compared with what we were doing for print. And specifically, all designers had to choose web safe versions of the beautiful print typeface they picked. Uh, and um, I just wanted to show a couple of examples of our work from that era and <laughs> it's just, extraordinary in, re in retrospect. So this is obviously 2006, it's for a, uh, a food manufacturing and packaging company um, uh, in South England. Uh, and we designed the logo, bought the beautiful typeface, um, and um, then everything else had to use Arial or Vedana. And so the only real mitigation here, the only kind of saving grace was great typography, which made up for these shortcomings and even then, the web developer who I was working with and building the sites was very, very clear that images needed to be around 400 pixels wide only, which is tiny, um, as people were viewing these sites using a dial-up modem. Uh, this is for an Irish publication, um, publication company in um, 
called Churchill House Press. And we loved doing this website and it was about as beautiful as it got at that point, but still obviously incredibly limited. And this state of affairs went on for years, even into the broadband era, because you always had to look back and allow for old browsers and loading speeds. Yet, despite all this, I have a certain fondness for that period. And one of the more interesting things about it, I think, was that re restriction forced re uh, reinvention or forced us to be more creative with what we had. I recall us constantly trying to find new ways of making the type feel fresh, even within that tiny selection. Um, in the years running up to 2010, there were many tech companies uh, in the background to this story trying desperately to change this web fonts uh, status quo. Um, Microsoft browsers ruled, dial-up was still widespread, and whenever I tried to push it creatively, the answer was always, computer says no. But suddenly, in the way of these things, there was this major technological break forward, leap forward. First, in 2009, this San Francisco-based company called Smallbatch launched the fledgling type kit, which Adobe later took over. Um, and this just showed the potential of the wider variety of online typefaces. But really, the fundamental change came in 2010 when Google launched its free hosted font service, adding a range of new typefaces. And just for us, having been so restricted for so many years, this changed everything. The selection was small to begin with, but quickly expanded. Yet the mere principle of web hosted type was massive. It opened the floodgates of possibility and combined with wider screen sizes becoming more standard was one of those magical paradigm shifting moments. This change in parameters fundamentally shifted the mindset of web designers from those eight or so original options, suddenly real discernment became possible. Uh, so this is Open Sans, it's widely used, particularly by the stationers company. Uh, Open Sans has many weights, including a beautiful light version, something which just didn't exist at all um, uh, prior to that point. Uh, there's the uh, hugely popular steel railway, um, again, a very light, delicate uh, typeface. And the, um, I think, incredibly crisp and elegant uh, Lato, uh, designed around that time, specifically for the web, uh, designed to be readable um, at all sizes. And at that point, um, the cat was out of the bag or Pandora's box was open for business. I think it's also worth mentioning the broader context of technology everyone was using at that point in time. Um, in offices, much larger high resolution desktop flat screens had become commonplace, as well as uh, um, a quantum leap forward in people's laptops that they were using. And of course, the iPad uh, and iPhone were changing the way people used the web forever with pinch and zoom um, and being able to see type crystal clear um, at all sizes on demand. It gave type space to breathe, particularly this idea of having type as big as you wanted it on the screen and a real appreciation uh, for cuts and weights, for different cuts and weights type. The web had overnight caught up with every aspect of graphic design and the exponential freedom that Google fonts had given felt almost dizzy. Where was that control, that restriction that forced us to be so inventive just a few years previous to that? In fact, it was gone forever, a good thing, um, giving way to a, a blank canvas. What it was incredible relief. I remember like the sudden freedom and I couldn't believe it at the time. But the funny thing was the best was yet to come. The moment when the web caught up with print was imminent. Uh, this came about in a series of stages. Uh, the first was hosted web for fonts uh, by Google. The second was uh, web open font format, which really defines where I'm heading next. This WAF web, web off open uh, font format was first devised around 10 years ago and established a single uh, way of uh, managing type on the web for all browsers. This was something that had been completely elusive and problematic up to this point. And at a stroke, it fundamentally changed the way type designers could work. However, it was the second version of this new format um, in 2018 that changed things for me. Well, not just for me, for designers everywhere, and in particular for typeface foundries. Uh, suddenly, online creation 
creatives could catch up with print. And uh, I, I've, you know, you look at this, uh, some screens we got earlier from uh, Saturday paper in Australia, um, and you compare it with the earlier independent um, uh, screen, uh, sheets we showed, and it's just in that same um, arena. And it allowed for two things anyone to put any typeface online with the use of a file stored in the website's hosting. And this allowed the owner of that typeface uh, to license the font per website. What this meant was that upstart founders, young guys, uh, young girls, every anywhere creating type could market their creativity to everyone and have copyright control of their work for the first time. From my perspective, it meant essentially going full circle back to the early days of the 2000s. I, or now indeed the broader type team of designers around me, got to choose the typefaces they want. Much like my fascination with emigre all those years before, we can uh, buy a license online and let the typeface define the brand of our client, which is obviously very much what Louisa was talking about uh, just um, shortly earlier. And so our choices define their eclecticism. I'm now going to show some ways in which we've uh, used a set of beautiful modern typefaces in our work. Um, this is uh, a website for a um, office, global office logistics company called MovePlan. Uh, <laughs> the difference between this and this uh, the earlier work I showed is extraordinary, but it used uh, a typeface called Sal, a beautiful typeface uh, created by a foundry called Schick Toika, who are based between Berlin and Helsinki. A second uh, piece of work I wanted to show was um, an unusual one. We were approached to do a website for a long dead opera singer uh, called Jennifer Vivian, uh, really for the foundation uh, in her name. And um, for this piece of work, the images we were given were not this one, but by and large old and often small. So large type ended up being um, a particularly key part of the layouts that we did. Uh, we chose uh, a typeface called Domain Display, this incredibly elegant uh, typeface, and its cousin, Sans Serif, faced Domain Sans by the New Zealand-based foundry, Klim. Uh, the third um, case study I wanted to just uh, talk about was for a German manufacturing business called Oris. Uh, we couldn't change the logo of the company, but we had a free license to change everything around it. And um, we had regular communication during the design process with the foundry who created this typeface called Brown Fox, which is uh, based in Berlin. Uh, this typeface is called Formula, and uh, we used a variety um, of weights, um, including a highly stylized outline uh, version. Um, and I really, I can't resist telling the story of our work uh, on the project, uh, having uh, devised the site uh, graphics and shot all the images over a period of many months, finally came to this sort of great point of uh, building the site a um, uh, problem was we chosen to put all our headlines uh, in this sort of outline style of world, you know, the way that world class is, uh, uh, is put there. Um, and it, um, it turns out we uh, didn't have a German S set uh, character often used uh, for words like Schloss uh, and uh, uh, it's just basically the abbreviation, the German abbreviation of a double S as you might know. Um, and I was a, a bit surprised, you know, the, uh, the foundry was German, and so we asked the type designers why, why, you know, why we didn't have an S set for the typeface, and um, they hadn't done one as they didn't really think it was ever going to be necessary for the, this massive, very heavy weight of the typeface. However, uh, it turns out our client required it, um, so uh, we uh, got into negotiation with Brand Fox and agreed to commission them uh, to draw up an S set, um, especially for us which once completed was supplied as a font file, uniquely for us, uh, uniquely for the client, and put on the website. And I think um, this fairly simple example of just a single character that was unique to us perhaps demonstrates the enormous flexibility of type on the web and a huge potential for creativity. And so this feels like a great conclusion. Um, when you consider those eight or ten typefaces we used to have, the idea of creating something special and one off of the web is uh, extraordinary. Um, it's such a far cry from where we started. Um, yet I think some things remain true and enthusiasm for great type, which can now be seen anywhere and everywhere, remains. Um, thank you all very much. Excellent, Richard. Thanks very much. That was so interesting to have 
that kind of history. I know you did a lot of research um, to find out about that. Well, I think for me, what's particularly interesting is how, you know, if you um, take your eye off the ball, five years goes past and things have changed so much and it's very difficult to catch up um, with, with technology, but it was really, really, very fascinating. So um, we do have some questions that are, that are coming. So we'll, we'll tackle those after David, our next speaker. Um, so many years ago, I had the good fortune to study alongside David at the LCP. I think it was that way around. Uh, uh, his career has involved working within publishing, report and accounts, brand identity, publicity, website design, wayfinding, and many things in between. He's based in Winchester and his design studio is called Buttercross. So uh, David's going to be talking to us about wayfinding. Um, so maybe now's the time to unmute and share your screen. Okay, great cause. Right, hopefully you can all see that. Um, and can you all see that? You should be able to. Okay, uh, I'm the last one for the evening. And uh, thank you to uh, Ben for that kind of introduction and to the Stationers Company for inviting me along. Um, I'll try and talk slowly. There's no subtitles tonight. Uh, but I'm going to talk about wayfinding versus brand recognition through typography. It's a bit of a mouthful, so we're just going to call it, where are you? Um, it's a little bit different from the previous two speakers, but there are some crossovers. Uh, over the last 10 years or so, uh, there's been more of a mention of a brand's touch points. Not so much around the typeface use, but hopefully I can convince you that the visibility of a brand works just as well, if a little more quietly, through the typeface. Um, there's a lot to get through, quite a bit. It's not really a deep dive, uh, so don't worry, but I'll be dipping into large scale wayfinding systems, specifically those used by train operating companies. Um, also, if it looks like I'm shaking my head, I, I'm on dual monitors and there's a little uh, pointer I can use, which is really cool. Uh, so I may use it on one of the slides, uh, but I might not. So let's begin. Um, setting the scene, uh, some terms that you might or might not have come across, uh, I don't know how much you know. Placemaking is a term you may have come across and that covers context, community, uh, the history of a site. It can be big or it can be small, um, it can even be inherited or manufactured and uh, it can create a positive mental state. Uh, wayfinding. There's a graphic design term which covers the forms, typography, colours, pictograms, messaging, uh, maps, floor and wall treatments, painting, landscaping, uh, all those kind of uh, visual clues and cues uh, that, that, that you need to get from A to B. Um, there's other wayfinding strategies, architecture can help, um, audio announcements, uh, none of which require physical signing, um, so I'm going to skip those. Uh, signing. Uh, you'll never hear me say signage. That's a whole other conversation. Uh, uh, signing is the visual and the physical part of a wayfinding system um, where the brand will be most visible, especially its typography. Uh, you might also have come across the term way showing, but right now it's kind of confusing, so we'll just brush over that. Uh, there are four types of sign. Information, so opening hours or, or maps. Uh, direction, which usually has arrows. Identification, uh, which would be the name of a station, for example, and regulatory, uh, which is your no smoking signs or emergency exits. Uh, a brand's visual expression should, of course, be consistent across all these touch points and across all the design elements, the colours, the pictograms and the typography. Uh, direction signs are the most visible at the moment of decision and decision points are a reflection of flow. So you would study where people enter, exit, uh, and transfer in a station. Uh, decision points also hold true for other environments without any specific flow, like museums, where you might need to get to uh, directly to a, direct to a gallery, um, but there's not really any through purpose. Um, I'm going to use a little pointer now. Uh, this is a bus and metro interchange in Singapore that I worked on, and we mapped the route, routes. Um, so passengers might leave the metro over here, 
and this is uh, one level up and they might go to the shops which are here or they might come along to the offices so uh, there's 31 floors mostly office blocks so from here the elevators escalators and these would be the decision points and that's where you might put a sign to tell people where they're going and the signs are fairly they, you know close together because you want to reassure people at, at, at multiple points where they could go in multiple directions where they're actually going to go um, and, uh, uh, this is a what's called a Belgian head arrow uh, it's the most perfect direction direction arrow there is but it's a whole other presentation uh, as possible there's other people in the world to know where the term Belgian head comes from and exactly what part of the arrow between the head and its terminals and the shaft it's referring to but there isn't many and I'm not going to tell you because I'm only 80% sure myself um, next slide uh, signing, this is a science bit. It's a, signing is a very visible part of a brand experience uh, and it will be coordinated and it will be, it makes sense and the choice of typeface uh, will be quite coherent. There are visual differences between the, the, as you'll probably know, the number one, the capital I and the lowercase l, or at least there should be. Um, other factors also affect re readability, including color, color contrast, X height, kerning, uh, not even getting into non Latin typefaces like Arab, Arabic. Leading us to how exactly is the size of the signing text determined against readability? Uh, a couple of guys, uh, Snellen and Landau, but Landau uh, worked out how to define visual acuity, uh, which you may have seen at your opticians and the eye charts. Uh, they are based on his work. Among other specifications, the visual acuity, which is your sharpness of uh, your vision, can actually be measured and is based on eye's ability to distinguish a gap, which will be this one here, I'm using the pointer again, uh, between two contours. And it's actually a set distance, so someone with perfect eyesight can distinguish that gap, and it's a specific measurement, and from there you can work out an ideal cap height um, at 20 metres, which is more or less the distance between signs, is actually around 75 millimetres in size of type. Uh, which kind of leads me on to a funny story. Uh, this is a typical uh, two-line sign. Um, it's 600 millimetres deep, 1.2 metres wide, cap height is 75 millimetres, and that's great. That's it, 20 metres, you should be able to see that. You don't need perfect eyesight, it only needs to be half as good. Uh, but a recent set of guidelines in the Middle East thought um, 180 millimetre cap height would, would be best at 20, 20 metres, which means everything scales up. So the sign is one and a half metres deep and almost three metres long. So that's how it hangs from a three metre uh, corridor ceiling height. Uh, you can't even get materials that size. but I have to admit, at least you can read it from 20 metres away. So moving on to the next slide. I don't really know if I'm talking fast or not. I'll try and slow down. Uh, designing the signing for a venue like a museum is no different to designing one for a national system. In both cases, you should be reassured about where you are in a museum. For example, you are able to walk to and through each gallery using the signing system and through the typeface, in part, you will experience the brand. And the national system, this is no different. It's only the multiplication, multiple locations that add an extra level to passenger confidence and engagement with the brand. After nationalisation in 1948, Britain's train companies needed a coherent visual language. Part of the new corporate identity consisted of Jockney and Margaret Carver's real alphabet typeface developed from their own transport type they still used on UK roads today. The same comprehensive rebranding in 1965 also included the rail symbol, not a logo, created by a young guy, 25, called Gerard Balney at the Design Research Unit. Great, well received, everything moved on, but privatisation in 1994 kind of announced the decline of the rail alphabet typeface on the network 
with most of the privatised train companies choosing their own brand typefaces for station signs. Brunel, which is this one up here, was designed in 1999 for rail track and was actually the, the Department for Transport's recommended new national standard for station signing. Um, until last year, that's all working there, it was still the recommended typeface. Now it's a new version of Real Alphabet, Real Alphabet 2. All this is still on the recommendation. It's all a bit of a mishmash with typefaces coming and going as quickly as franchises change hands, or it seems quickly. It's not actually that quick. While I was working and learning uh, with Transport Design Consultancy in 2018, we developed the signing and wayfinding principles for West Midlands Railway using the initially approved Brunel. I had used it on other franchises too. Uh, in theory, the signing across different franchises was at least unified by a typeface across the whole network. Not particularly great for a new franchise though, pushing brand recognition, especially as part of a greater Transport for West Midlands group, which included buses and metro and cycling. So we had to change it to their brand typeface, Circular. Before you say anything, there's nothing wrong with Circular as a brand typeface. It's a decent, recent, uh, geometric, grotesque, in line with uh, Futura, which, which is supposed to pronounce Futura, it's really nice. Uh, it's been used on a unit edition monograph for FHK Henry and in the pages of New York Times magazine. It just doesn't lend itself seriously to signing. It's a bit idiosyncratic and commits a few sins in terms of re readability. Like, uh, I will just point one out. This here, this gap between the tail of the E is, is really close for signing because from a distance, it could look like an O. This is a capital I, and that's a lowercase L. Anyway, I digress. I just wonder why a graphic designer would choose for a brand typeface, one which is going to be mostly visible on signing across a wide network, one that isn't designed for the intended function. Uh, it's controversial to say style over substance. Who knows? It's nicely fading out. Is there then a good example I can show you that you might even recognise of a typeface that works system-wide across multiple stations and is on brand? Of course there is. It's not just good, it's great. In terms of brand recognition through typeface and placemaking, you can't beat London Underground's Johnson. It was designed for purpose, it's fit for purpose, it's Goldilocks, it's just right. The typeface was commissioned in 1913, introduced in 1916 and designed by Edward Johnson. Its intention was to bring a visual uniformity to the transport network between the then different train operating companies. Bit of history repeating, all using the same rails and tunnels and to strengthen the company's brand. It's only been updated a few times, once in the 1970s and again in 2016 with some small tweaks or additional weights to match technology or digital media. The roundel or bullseye was first introduced in 1908 and formalized in 1919 by Johnson too. It's all things a signing typeface needs to be. Readable, simple, and in terms of branding, it's entirely recognizable too. It's been the brand typeface for all public transport in London since 1933 and is one of the longest serving examples of corporate branding. I'm pretty sure you've all seen it, but it's an example of having your cake and eating it. My time's almost up. For the most part, you will use the most appropriate typeface for the most appropriate function. Brunel, Frutiger or Din for signing, Sabon or Garmin maybe for books, Circular or Helvetica for magazines if you must, Open Sans for websites or presentations like this one, and Comic Sans for all its naysayers for fun. Form follows function and it's the same in typography as in everything else. When you're traveling, especially to an unfam unfamiliar environment, you're vulnerable and the sign typeface needs to be confident. You need to know where you are and that you're going, that where you're going will be a reassuring transition. The West Midlands Railway example is not a David and Goliath story. There's no winner there. 
what it does highlight is that travelling is a passenger first journey and not a brand journey. But London Underground proves that it's possible to do both. As a passenger, you want support in finding the most appropriate way to get from A to B, designed with clarity and consistency, especially between stations. The message needs to be clear. Where are you? You are here. And thank you for listening. Great. That was really good, Dave. Thank you very much. Um, so I think uh, everyone's going to come back in the room now to, to do some Q&A. Um, so there we are. I think we're all there now. Um, we need to unmute our speakers. But we've got quite a few questions. We've got lots of comments, which I know there are questions in the comments as well. So I'm not sure we're going to get through everything, but um, I'll tackle the, the Q&A ones first. Um, and anyone who wants to dive in can dive in. Otherwise, I'll pick one of you. Sound like a teacher now. Um, uh, how, this is actually a big question. I think this, is, this could be a one sentence uh, from each of you. Um, how does someone starting out get a job as a typographer? Do you need particular skills? This is from Laura Broadberry. Dave. Uh, you don't need particular skills in anything you want to do. You just need passion and uh, to be able to want to do it. Um, the tools that you need to, to, to do typography um, are all there. They're all on the internet now. You can just do it, try it, just be passionate about it. I think, I, think um, um, I, I, I mean, I remember learning how to do, um, to draw type by hand. And I think, um, strange as it sounds, that that uh, discipline, that learning about how the letter forms actually work and fit together is a really good start. And um, to pick up what David's saying, I think I sort of get a handle on skills around that by hand, if possible, and then take that to your computer, that kind of do it with a pencil, then take it to the screen um, uh, methodology has always worked very well for me. Louisa. Uh, yes, I I agree with uh, starting with the pencil and if you can if you are interested in learning more about typography, it is interesting to learn calligraphy and to to learn the structure of letters in other ways. I do not think that there is a specific set of skills that you can check off a list and that makes you a typographer. Um, as you saw today, there are so many different areas of typography, uh, and these are just three. There are so many. Um, we are always learning, and I do not believe you need a, a background in graphic design, but if you have the one, it helps. Um, it's we don't have a very structured profession in this sense, but uh, it's possible to learn and to be curious and to always dive deeper. And as you go along, you will learn to see things that you were not able to see before. And I think this is key. Yeah, I think um, sometimes employers are looking for that bit of paper that says you attended a college and maybe some people like to employ people from the college they went to there's a you know sometimes there's a bit of snobbery about those things but um yeah that's interesting thanks for those answers um we've got a, a question from andrew wilson and i thought this was quite an interesting one he's, he says um he's making an observation really that which is i think a really common one is that um he, he's saying that to the untrained eye the nokia face didn't look that different and I think that as, as a general point is that people often don't sort of, uh, aren't able to verbalize what they're seeing when they're confronted by a typeface. It just feels different. And um, I just wonder if any, any of you have got thoughts on that. I, I mean, for me, it's about the detailing and it's about maybe the character set that's there or something like that um, as to maybe why you would choose something but I just wonder if you had any thoughts on being able to tell things apart or for instance circular looking like Avenir or uh, there was another one I can't remember who showed it but there was a couple of faces that you showed that looked like Avenir or they had the same feeling I was wondering if you had some thoughts about 
differences and similarities and type choice. Thank I you, Paul. Oh, go on. No, go on. Oh, are you sure? <laughs> this is what I meant by learning to see things that you were not able to see before the third the more you you learn and the more you dive deep you are able to see things that before just look the same um i suppose it's like that story that people say that the eskimos are able to distinguish so many shades of white so many more shades of white than the average population of the world uh because i suppose they see it a lot and and then they can identify and distinguish them um the same goes with typography so Maybe when you are starting out in typography, you quickly learn to differentiate a serif from a sans serif. And this is a first starting point. Uh, but as you go further, you will be able to look at a sans serif and see, is the contrast the same in this one or in the other? Is the axis of the contrast? Or later on, you will see the terminals. Are the terminals the same shape? Is the gestural quality of the typeface the same? And this just goes by looking at them and analyzing them. Uh, are the more you look at something the more you can see this is the short answer but would um you know is the point that why are faces that are seemingly so similar um re, you know made you know if we've got you know like i mentioned half a million there's probably lots of similarity between lots of them why would you embark on a new face if there's half a million to choose from maybe that goes back to licenses it's cheaper to design a new typeface than for it to be proprietary and to, to commercialize a typeface that's already existing. Okay. Well, that was certainly the true of some of those early web typefaces and um, Lato was based on um, um, some of like the, the classic Gothic typefaces like News Gothic. They, um, uh, they couldn't license it for the web. So they did their own thing, but in doing so created something completely different. So I, I, I think, it's, um, I think Louise has got it right. You know, it's to do with like, the minute you hold those two typefaces for knocking together, you can see they, um, for me, one feels like a progression from the other. I think that the similarity in the question actually, that the, the question is kind of the answer in a way, like the two things feel like a journey from one thing to the next. So in, in a sense, you know, if you were used to the way Nokia used to be, as an observer, it seemed to me like a logical progression a natural progression, if you like, to the uh, the new version. But was it intended to be that way, Louise? Um, I am not sure. I was not involved at the beginning of the project. Uh, I imagine that there is a sense of progression in that a brand usually doesn't want to break completely with what they were before because they need to, to have some uh, element of continuation and recognizability. Um, so if Coca-Cola suddenly changes their logo to blue, um, that's, that would mean that people don't find it in the supermarket for one thing. So I think there's, a, there's an element of continuation there. As for the question of why do we need to create new typefaces, it's funny because we, as type designers, we get asked this question a lot. I think a lot of people never stop to think that type designers exist. It's more, um, the written word exists and most people don't think too much about the typography and how it got there and then how the typefaces came to be. And it's always this, um, especially people who are not designers and they ask, why do we need more typefaces? We already have so many. Um, that's true. But you can also say this about anything. Why do we need new um, clothes uh, in the world, uh, the shapes of the clothes that exist already keep us um, warm and cover our private bits in public and we don't need to keep inventing new fashions every year. Why do we need new songs? There are so many songs already in the world. Why would anybody write a new song? Um, and yet they do. Uh, and when you think that there cannot possibly be anything new, people do come up with new things and it's subtle. So. Um, Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, we've got a question from Eamon O'Reilly, and he it it specifically asked Louisa whether you have a methodology, but we can also open it to David and, and Richard as well. Um, so do you have a methodology, a process when approaching font design? And maybe the, the, the other two, you could think about that as well. 
Um, yes, if it's a custom typeface, I start by looking at the brief. Uh, I, I might do some research on um, other typefaces and other lettering contexts. For example, for the Frenchette project, because it was, um, it had a relationship to France. I looked at typography in um, signs around, uh, around Paris uh, for restaurants and all of this. Then I sketch a lot and I write a lot and then I go to the computer and, and use a type software and go from there. And then it's just refining and refining and refining until I get somewhere I like. Yeah, that's it, isn't it? It's, it's you know, the time is the iteration. It's, it's, not, it's not a production job really, is it? It's kind of, you know, they're paying for the five, 500 versions. You don't, you don't show them. Yeah. Exactly. And the beauty is in the, yeah, is in the garbage and all that. Yeah. <laughs> the stuff they'll never see. <laughs> Um, okay, um, I'm looking at the time with seven minutes past. I'm, I'm going to do one more question and then I think we'll draw things to a close. So maybe um, uh, Phil Elloway uh, is asking a question. Um, two parts. Uh, have the panel found that branding is now the main driver of clients' interest in typography? I think that's the question or have other benefits such as readability being important to them too so have the panel found that branding is the main driver of their interest in typography i think well it's interesting i think an awful lot of clients have become a lot more discerning put it that way they uh they uh, know uh, what they want and they know when something isn't right for them and I think that level of discernment is something which has increased with time. And, um, and you know, when they see something that they really love, uh, when they see something that they kind of feel kind of chimes with them, they'll say so. And I think that um, that's something that is relatively new and relatively um, something which has kind of grown and grown in recent years. Um, you know, from being told what they're going to have because it's right for them now, they're much more discerning. Okay, thanks. Dave, have you got anything to offer before I draw things to a close? Well, not really. I mean, you, you choose a typeface that's fit for purpose. So, you know, we wouldn't use Comic Sans on, on signing, for example, just because it would be confusing and you wouldn't use um, a, a signing typeface. Well, you might. You might use a signing typeface for a book or a magazine. Um, Fruitiger is a signing typeface and Din is a signing typeface. And they, they've managed to sort of spread out, but really you want the typeface to fit, fit the purpose. And, and to the extent of we use um, a custom logo type, that's perfectly fit for purpose. And it was designed that way. Well, I think that's not a bad place to end, talking about Comic Sans. Um, so everyone's mentioned. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> um, I, I will just say a, a, a few things just to draw proceedings to a close. Um, so I'd like to thank Tony Mash for, uh, for Liveryman Tony Mash for suggesting the talk to Liveryman Carol Tullow for encouraging me to put it together and to Lucy McCord for supervising us all and keeping us all in order. Most of all, thank you to you three for your uh, superb presentations and your insights into your um, subject areas. Louise Beta, Freeman, Richard Chapman, and David Lindston really enjoyed that. Um, I hope the audience has enjoyed the event and you'll join us in a year, well, sooner than a year, but maybe in a year when we're back in the hall, a nicely refurbished hall in central London. Um, so goodbye everyone. Thank you very much for attending. <laughs>